Okay, everybody, welcome to the Unshakable Show. Uh, there's a round of applause. We always have. Great to have you with us tonight. We have another special guest with us, Joanna Williamson. She's here all the way from London, UK. Uh, Joanna is the co-founder of One Rock, which we'll talk about in a minute. She also is the founder of She Lives. She's an academic, a lecturer, and a friend of us. So it's great to have you with us, Joanna. Tell us about Thank yourself. You and a little bit about One Rock and She Lives. Sure. So my name is Joanna, but actually I'm in the middle of changing my name back to Asha, which is my Polish name. It sounds much more exotic and it kind of conveys much more my, my heritage and my love for Asia because Asha spells like Asia. And uh, yeah, I'm a founder of One Rock with my husband. We do leadership training mentoring and coaching um, we run one year programs uh, which we have also renamed hey it's a season of renaming new season <laughs> and it's not called academy anymore because uh, the lovely sea free church in cambridge is also running academies so we decided we're going to give it a new name it's going to be called nexus leadership institute um, nexus stands for connection and a focal point and we are very passionate about going into large cities around the world and setting up communities of mentoring and coaching that journey together for a period of one year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's One Rock. And out of One Rock, I have recently started a ministry for women called She Lives, Live Your Best Story. At She Lives, we are all about helping women live out their best story in the complex um, and the changing world uh, and context. Uh, so at the moment, I consider myself a missional and entrepreneur. Um, I'm not bragging in any way. I just kind of finding my own voice in who I am, really. Somebody said that um, I'm like a bamboo and that I kind of grow in all sorts of different directions all at the same time. And I think I'm embracing this, um, embracing that actually one doesn't have to have just one thing going on in their life, that they are growing, that they can plant and grow exponentially in all sorts of different directions and I think that that's pretty much me so right. yes so she lives itself even though it's a new ministry it has now grown to two different programs one is called I have a voice and it's based on the acronym voice and this program is running in Brazil and uh, during COVID, um, so four weeks ago, at the beginning of COVID, I, I have launched small groups, uh, online small groups called Orchards. And currently there are three different Orchards that are meeting online. Uh, and these are groups of women talking about Holy Spirit and anxiety, fear, loss, loss of purpose. Right, right. Yeah. So you, you do an awful lot of travel normally, do you not? Do you mention Brazil? Or normally. Right? I know you yes. travel a lot. So what does life <laughs> normally look like and what does life look like now for you? Yes, interesting. We do uh, do a lot of travel, especially I am away most of a month for probably two weeks on average uh, internationally. And um, so normally I'm on a plane, I'm in a different country, um, and, uh, and now I'm not. I'm at my desk or in my yard on the swing. Um, so the life has changed drastically. And uh, I went through a season of grief about that because most of my ministry currently is in Asia. So I feel like my wave of grief came a little bit earlier, probably January, February, because I have realized I may not be able to go to Asia. Um, so I feel like I am on the other side of grief about traveling, but it has really impacted my sense of identity and who I am. And I have been processing this, how much international ministry is a part of who I am. And I came to realize that actually, uh, because it's something that God has called me to do, I believe that he will keep it safe for me in the sense like that it's not going to just dissolve and disappear because I have not created it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God will keep it safe on the back burner um, until what I'm ready to travel again. But it has been a major change. Um, mm -hmm. And Can I think that... Can uh, that a bit, Joanna? Because um, I think you're absolutely right, and maybe we're not talking about it enough, all of us are experiencing grief because we've all lost mm -hmm. and, and that can be losing loved ones. That can be losing yes. 
simple answers that we once had that we that were try it can be our order of life it can be jobs in so many ways lost 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 through this uh, okay. covid-19 how have you processed that then could you give us some keys to help with that um slowly and painfully <laughs> i've been processing it i think if i were to maybe narrow it down to two practical things that just seem so simple but they have really worked for me is obviously journaling. I think journaling has been a part of my spiritual work with God for 23 years. Uh, it has been an avenue of healing. It has been an avenue of monitoring my growth and processing it. Uh, so without being able to journal my story, uh, I don't think I would be able to cope as well because my mind becomes overwhelmed. I prob you know, we all think quicker than we write. So the process of writing slows the thinking down and God really speaks to me in between the lines. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, writing gives God an opportunity to come in in between the lines and really speak to us. So journaling has been such a great way to process. Um, I think another thing that has been really meaningful to me, uh, it's a newly discovered discipline of symbols. Um, I cannot really explain it well, but it goes back to four years ago when my mom passed away. Uh, I kind of felt like I need some symbolic ways to remember her and to celebrate her life. Because if I don't, then I don't know who will. Uh, she had a small network of friends. Um, and I think at this time, symbolic things have really helped me. So planting things, um, I started to plant things from the seed. And as I plant, it's really a spiritual discipline for me. I think um, about things that I have been planting all around the world and how I need to cultivate them. What do I need to do to show care and compassion, to keep this connection, to keep watering the plants that I have planted around the world? Um, I kind of come to terms with the fact that some of the seeds will probably get eaten away and will not bear fruit. And I think it takes a lot of courage to be able to accept loss and look, uh, look the loss in its face almost and accept it. But it is a journey. And I think that because we are embodied and we live in our body, I think we must find ways uh, in which we can include our body in a spiritual discipline of praying and processing. I really think it's so important. So even things like when I pray for new opportunities to open up, I will physically go to the door. And as I pray, I will open the door physically and will pray, Jesus, I'm praying for the door to be open. And I cannot even, I know that I probably don't have time to get into this, but this has helped me to really experience healing with my whole body because I'm experiencing loss with my whole body. Mm. I'm experiencing stress and the stress is, manifesting itself in my body so therefore i think i need to provide avenues for healing both in my emotions and in my body mm -hmm. uh, if it makes sense yeah that makes a lot of sense this has really helped me yeah really really helpful i i was even when you're talking about planting i'm thinking about buying a certain rose bush that steve's mum had certain flowers that um roses tea roses mm -hmm. she loved and so I've been looking up and thinking, can I order a tea rose and put it in the garden? So that's something to me mem uh, keep memory of her, you know, because and I'm thinking of maybe mm -hmm. I to my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, so that we've all got this rose bush that we can, obviously it's not the mum, but it, it represents something to us of, of her life, of what she cherished and flowers were a big part. But I love that idea of you planting seeds and nurturing the seeds and mm -hmm. the seeds will be eaten and they'll be mm -hmm. squashed by the yes. thoughts of what God's word. And it really goes against my personality. I ma must mention that uh, I am not a patient person and I don't like to be kept in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like planting seeds is very much uh, trusting that there is work that goes on in the invisible realm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, And I think we, especially as Christians, we want to exercise the the prophetic we want to exercise the discernment because this is what the spirit brings into our life so we are constantly trying to to look into the unknown and look into the darkness and make meaning we are meaning making beings and 
and I think the fact that I have chosen to plant seeds as opposed to fully grown plants mm. for me is also a discipline of trusting Lord I don't need to be constantly redigging things and constantly looking into tomorrow trying to work out what is hiding in the dark because God is in the invisible and he's working in the invisible and I just need to trust it yeah. um, yeah. and it's been a really amazing experience for me mm. you, you set up these groups you said um, orchard groups uh, for this season so t- tell us a little bit more about them and they specifically for for women did you say or are they for anyone Yes, so I have opened them up for uh, women, though the London Orchard is also for men, because in our community we have some doctors and nurses, uh, male doctors and nurses that are really struggling, and I just really didn't want to cut people off. But most of the orchard groups are just for women. And the idea behind it is really to connect with, this is how I talk about it, to connect with the power of the Holy Spirit to abide in his presence, to experience his peace, and to live fruitfully uh, in his purposes. So P, um, all the P's, four P's of Orchard. And the Orchard, the name Orchard comes from the message translation of Galatians 5, uh, where it says that we can bear fruit as the fruit grows in the Orchard. And uh, so we talk about the Holy Spirit, Uh, And I think this is really important to have the lenses through which we then look at the realities of today's life. Mm -hmm. So we talk about anxiety, we talk about fear, uh, we talk about the sense of loss. We've been doing it for three weeks. We are still talking about anxiety. It has been incredibly helpful, just a simple thing, um, looking at the definitions of fear, anxiety, and worry. And because we tend to lump them together, but kind of understanding how different they are, biblically different as well, I think, um, will help us, I believe, to find the right cure or medicine to apply to the condition, once you understand the condition. Hmm. So it has been really amazing conversations about, for example, how we fear. uh, From a biblical perspective, we can probably, you know, we cast out the fear. And uh, fear is much more manageable in a way because it's much more concrete. Fear of spiders, fear of flying. So the moment the object of fear is removed, the fear also dissipates. But anxiety is slippery. And I genuinely don't think we can just cast out anxiety and say to somebody, hey, don't be anxious. I think from a spiritual perspective, anxiety is more as a stronghold. It functions as a stronghold. Uh, It's much more embedded uh, in our life. It affects our life much more. And that's why it's much harder to dislodge. And then worry, uh, interestingly, um, in the Bible, in the biblical Greek, it means to separate and divide. But in Oxford Dictionary, it means to choke by ripping somebody's throat. Um, And I think that's really kind of quite interesting for those of us who experience worry. I think we can relate to this sense of choking. But we we want to have honest conversations about these matters, but always in the context of God's power, uh, Holy Spirit power, presence, peace, and purpose. Hmm. Yeah. So we had some great conversations, especially with Orchard Rwanda. Um, we have a group of women in Rwanda that are post-traumatic um, that have post-traumatic symptoms um, after the genocide. The two girls that are mentoring, um, they both have lost, uh, apart from one sister, they both have lost their families in genocide, often witnessed the genocide. um, And they feel like they have never really had an opportunity to process it, both in society, where I think they were told and maybe rightfully so. I mean, it's really difficult to judge from our comfort, uh, from the comfort of our seats here. But they were told not to go back to the graves, not to even the president himself didn't go to the graves because he felt it will evoke some sort of anger and desire for revenge. So they were really told to move on quite quickly because people were afraid that then there will be revenge. But then I think in churches as well, so much theology is around 
you just don't have enough faith if you experience fear. And I think we really need to go against it because it's not teaching, I believe. Um, and um, so we can see that it's very much a part of our human experience and we have to have a courage to deal with that. And um, yes, I'm sorry, I don't want to preach, but I'm really passionate about that yeah. because um, just one, one last thing on it. Having said that, having said that, uh, that fear and anxiety are a part of our life and we should not condemn people for having it or judge them for, for the lack of faith, I do believe that we can be healed from mental health issues. Um, I, it's kind of, I've made it my personal mandate because I've been thinking about it so much, how often we pray for physical healing yeah. and we believe that somebody can be healed from cancer right or can heal from something but when it comes to mental health issues we just kind of think well if i can just manage it you know if it can just get better mm -hmm. so if somebody has got depression people are often afraid oh now you are set for life because you have developed some sort of neural pathways and you will always be vulnerable to falling back into depression but i want to i don't want to dismiss these but I want to believe that the healing of mental health is also possible uh, to the extent that we believe in a physical healing. Right. Mm, super. Well, fascinating, fascinating <laughs> Great the work that you're doing. Yeah. It would be good to hear more, more from you. I mean, are there, are there any books or anything that you'd recommend for people who are listening um, today? Are there things that you would, you know, people could look at if they want to know more? Could they join a group okay. or is there things that they could? could help them interesting uh, so in terms of uh, orchard groups and talking about anxiety i would have to probably think about that mm -hmm. uh, because um, i think like at the moment i'm just going back to my experiences over the years with and the stuff that i have read so surprisingly i haven't been doing any fresh re fresh research on it so i need to probably go back to some good books but if i can recommend other books that have helped me um, and build up my faith mm -hmm. uh, then i would definitely say the lives of other missionaries and great men and women of god something that we are really passionate at one rock is telling the stories of other great people mm -hmm. and uh, i have been reading and rereading the story of, i even have it here uh, the story of hudson taylor an inland china mission and uh, I wrote a biography about Hudson Taylor before, but now I am reading it um, from a very different perspective. And for me, at the moment, it's a lifesaver because the fact that it took him five months to travel to China on a boat, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in a lockdown, so to say, the fact that then he had to come back from China and he was struggling with illness for six years and was told he will never be able to go back to China. The fact that he did so much with so little and the conflict in the team and just that sometimes, you know, the people that they're the backbiting and it's just absolutely incredible stories. And I think that um, what keeps me going during this time are the stories of these people, how they overcome. And also, I think that the great thing about studying the lives of people that are dead, if I may say so, you know, is that they, you kind of see their whole story. And uh, we are we are all, all in the middle of a story here. We really are, and it's yeah. so difficult to judge what the story will be. But when you read somebody's life as a completed story, mm -hmm. you see that these chapters change. The chapters do change. They don't last forever, and people overcome their fears and their anxieties and their lack of purpose and the mm -hmm. opposition and. And the weather changes and uh, it, it is okay in the end. And yes. I find such a great comfort in it. Um, yeah. So Hudson Taylor, Amy Carmichael, John Wesley, William Wilberforce, mm -hmm. I can go forever. <laughs> That's great because it really gives us perspective then or, or enables us to have perspective when we think yes. something is the end. It really isn't in our life. It's a season part of the big story. I love that. Right. See, just a couple more time, times going as ever. Um, you did some research, I know, uh, on millennials in the past because you came and did some stuff with us here at C3. Do you think millennials are responding any differently in this season than people of other generations? Or have you not given that any thought? Uh, and obviously, they've been a very 
tech-savvy generation, um, and some of us are catching up, if we ever will, let's be honest, we won't. Um, and then the generation behind started with, in a different place. Any observations? Mm, interesting. <clears throat> wow. It's great that you presume that I'm so deep, you know. <laughs> I, I can just sit in my garden and think about all these things. Um, so we do, uh, we do work a lot with millennials, and uh, I think it's just been really interesting to observe from a London perspective. First of all, uh, so our church um, that is full of older people has actually grown quite a lot in numbers, but it has been harder in many ways to engage younger people in our context online. And I think it's because there are just so many different choices and it's not new anymore. And I think that we have observed that there is a real tiredness of of just being online. People are zoomed out yeah. and uh, I am beginning to see that to have actually somebody participate in our Zoom calls is a real gift because they are really choosing intentionally to be with us mm. as opposed to just, you know, whatever. But it does present a challenge because um, th there are so many different options and we are competing against uh, huge options. But I think anxiety Obviously, the millennial generation has been called the most anxious generation. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, COVID-19 has blown into, the, into flames what was already there, which is a sense of anxiety and mm -hmm. loss of purpose, maybe. Um, but I think that we, um, we must remember that every generation, in many ways, needs to find their own ways to respond to it. Um, and and they will find their way, they will find their feet in it. Uh, and I really am a true believer that um, that we as humans are resilient. And, I, and I, I think that we have disabled the millennial generation a bit too much by putting labels on them. Um, you know, and I think that they are anxious generation, but I don't want this to define them. I think that they can also be resilient generation and creative generation and their entrepreneurial generation. And one of the research also about millennials is that uh, they assign much more uh, weight in, uh, to meaning rather than finance. So they like experience, they would, they would choose a job that provides a better environment and experience and growth as opposed to the salary. So I think in terms of money, we are picking up that millennials are less worried about the income. They are probably more overwhelmed by the lack of opportunities to either travel or develop themselves or grow. They are looking for connection. Mm. Um, mm. Wow. But I will go away and think deeper about that. No, that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Really Very good. good. We good. were going to talk education and all sorts to you, but we haven't had time. No. <laughs> well, I think you've educated us, so that's good. I was going to ask oh, you what well. lessons are you so been learning? They're coming through loud and clear, so it's, it's really great. Thank you, Joanna. We really appreciate you. your time and your friendship. And I think you've brought some great insights and wisdom there for us that will be helpful for our listeners. We're going to have so to. So, can end I it. ask you a question as well, just to think about? Okay. So, I'm thinking that um, this is what I'm thinking recently. I think that uh, the antidote for fear is faith, for worry is trust. And for anxiety is joy. Mm -hmm. And I'm challenging everybody to do a biblical study on this and tell me whether I'm kind of on the right track. Here. Yeah. My wife's making notes yeah. even as you speak. And we will, I, I love that thought. Um, and I think that all flows out from the presence of God. You know, so uh, we, we preached a, a message recently that the antidote to fear is God's presence. Fear not, for mm -hmm. I am with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll look into that. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you for being with us thank today. You. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I love C3 and you guys doing a great job. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and we finish as ever by saying our little phrase, but we mean it. We are C3 wherever we are. We love you guys. You're